Um, thanks guys for coming to the 3D printing survey. Uh, my name is Susan Hinton and this is my very esteemed, like awesome 3D printing friend, Mike Skalnik. And um, we're here to tell you about 3D printing. Um, there's a lot of kind of mystery around it. Not everyone's really aware of, about technically how it works. And so we're hoping to, um, you know, uncover some of those mysteries for you, but also set you on a path where you know how to use 3D printed parts in your robots for this conference and beyond. So we can 3D print your robot armies and you shouldn't be scared of them either because they're really cool. So a little bit of history about 3D printers. Um, before 2009, 3D printers were extremely expensive and I'm talking about tens of thousands of dollars to like hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, they required pricey materials such as metals and very specialized plastics and resins and things like that. They were kind of dangerous too. Some of those resins are very toxic. Um, and so they were out of the hands of consumers like you and me and people that want to have them in the office or in our home or even in a garage or a hacker space. Um, they, they are, however, very good quality and very accurate and that's thanks to some very fancy patents that are still in effect as well. And so. Before 2009, the 3D printing scene was kind of bleak, and it was just for like kind of the elite, you know, industrial designers and people that had a lot of money. So this became about because in 1989, S. Scott Crump, he invented FDM. Now FDM is um, stands for fused deposition modeling, and essentially that just means that the 3D printers that you see in the room next door are actually FDM technology. Um, basically, what it means is a, a layer at a time, it's depositing plastic, and it's just kind of like a soft serve machine. So when the ice cream comes out, you have to move the cone around to catch it, and you just layer it around in a swirl, and then it, you get the height of the ice cream. The FDM machines work in exactly the same way. They're just catching the plastic in a much kind of finer resolution than a soft serve machine. And so he, um, S. Scott Crump, invented that technology, and then uh, he patented it as part of Stratasys. Um, so that kind of got locked down for a while. You can see there's a big gap between 1989 and 2007, which was a real shame. Um, but that's when the RepRap Darwin was released, and they started doing it, as you can see, two years before that patent expired, but they were gearing up to, to be able to have that open and available for everyone to use. Now, the RepRap, for those who don't know, is, um, again, one of the first open source 3D printers that came out. And it's called a RepRap because it was designed to be able to replicate itself. So when you print out a RepRap, or if you buy a kit for one, you're actually also meant to be taking an oath, oath at the same time that you will print out the parts for another RepRap for someone else to build. So it needs to self-replicate as it goes along. So I think that's a really awesome thing. Um, by 2009, the fused deposition modeling pattern expires, which is awesome. So that's when we started seeing this huge explosion of like home kit 3D printers. And so the MakerBot released their very first 3D printer, which was the Cupcake. Um, and by 2012, there were actually already more than 50 consumer level 3D printers on the market, which is a surprising number. You might have thought it was only the RepRap and maybe MakerBot and a couple of others, but there were a lot of them that exploded onto the scene thanks to RepRap's kind of foundation that they laid. And I think the cool thing is now that bigger companies are also starting to realize that consumers want 3D printers. So you have like the Dremel 3D printer. Exactly. And things like that. So you're seeing a lot of competition in the space now, which is really fun. It is really cool. And even like Autodesk is doing yeah. something as well. They, they're actually realizing that there's a lot of value in it and there's a lot of innovation they can provide as well. So like what's currently out there, you know, again, there's, there's hundreds of them on the market now. If you even go onto Kickstarter and search 3D printer, there's just like a whole menagerie of them there even. Um, and so I just wanted to cover kind of like some of the most cheapest ones that still like work really well and then some of the more expensive ones. And so just to quickly summarize that, uh, the PrinterBot Simple, the, the metal version, is out there right now for $600. It's even less as a kit. I think it's about $50 cheaper as a kit. Um, that prints very, very well. I've, I've been very impressed with the prints. I know that Pavel actually owns one, so I'm just volunteering him to be asked about it later on if you want to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, oh, I spelled it wrong. I do apologize. The Lulzbot Taz 4, 
are actually the, the, our fleet of six 3D printers next door. They're actually 2200, and they come with a lot of the kit and caboodle and the fancy stuff that you actually see um, today. So definitely consider buying something that's a little higher budget too, because sometimes you do get that better quality and the, the bigger build platform and that kind of thing. That's a quick summary of kind of where the market is and how much you're probably going to shell out to, to get one if you want one and yourself. One of my favorite things about the printer bots is that they actually release kits as they release new printers to upgrade older printers. Yes. So you can buy your printer and then in a year when they come out with a new version, they'll give you a $200 kit that you can use to upgrade your printer, which is really, really nice. It's really cool of them. Everything's open source that yeah. they do too. And I actually have a really old printer of theirs from 2012. Every time they come out with something, whether they say it supports my printer or not, I buy it and I manage to squish it to fit and it's always awesome. And so that's a really good thing about the printer bot company. They, they're really, really good with their community. Got the bot kits oh. Yes, actually. So if you got your sumo bot kits, you'll see a little kind of neon brightly colored, um, like what, what, a ball, ball caster, caster, right? Yeah. So the, the ball goes in there and it rolls around as your third wheel on your sumo bot. That was printed on Pavel's personal machine, so definitely thank him for that. So how do they operate? Um, we were going to do a FaceTime call with Chris, which was why you saw my mug on the screen for so long, but we didn't get to do that. Um, and so I'm going to talk about this, uh, this kind of flow first. And so when you usually print out like a Word document or if you're laser cutting or anything like that, it all starts with a file, right? And that file has to be printed. And it's actually very similar with 3D printing. You just have to have the correct file and you can actually hit the print button and that's exactly what happens if your 3D printer is connected to your computer. So there is a file format that is called STL. There's a bit of a kind of a disagreement in the community as to what exactly it means. Some people think it means um, stereo lithography file. Um, other, other people say other things. I don't know what you've heard. I've always heard stereo lithography file. Mm -hmm. I've heard something weird. I just can't remember what it is. Hmm. And essentially, that file actually just holds the model information. So it's like a, a mesh, essentially. It's all of the polygons and everything that describe how that model looks. So you can have everything from like gaming, video game characters and things like in that STL file, and it's just describing how it looks. So it doesn't really have a lot of detail in there to do with the 3D print. That's where a slicer comes in, which Mike's going to explain very soon. Um, mm -hmm. And I have two examples there. One is slicer with a three, because they're cool. <laughs> and then the other one you might have heard of, um, that specific proprietary software for the MakerBot is MakerWare, and they also make it easy. And so essentially all you're doing is importing the file in, giving it some options, which again, Mike will cover in a second telling it whether you want it to be solid or hollow, telling it what scale you want, um, and just uh, the resolution and things like that. And then it will take that file, figure out how to turn that into machine instructions, and it converts it to a G-code file. And um, we're going to show you some examples of how easy G-code is to kind of understand and interpret later on as well. Once that G-code file is complete, it just sends it straight to the 3D printer and it just streams it as instructions, very much like any computer programming language. And then what comes out the other end when it reaches the end of the file is actually the completed 3D printed object. So there's, there's a layer of abstraction in there, but it's actually not anything sort of magical. It's, it's actually pretty simple, although slicing software would be a nightmare to write, definitely. So, Mike, what is a slicer? So, slicers are really cool, and they're actually named very well. So, if <laughs> you think about how we're, these printers are working, they're laying down plastic one layer at a time, moving slightly up above that, and then laying down another layer of plastic. Well, a slicer takes your 3D file, cuts it into tiny little layers, and makes each of those little instructions to tell the printer where to actually, excuse me, actually where to lay down plastic. Uh, it also has instructions for how hot to go, how... Um, like if it somehow like have support for noises or updating the screen or things like that, but it's mostly just like how to move the print head where you want it to go. So the slicing characteristics as well that you would be able to... So yeah, in your slicer you can usually modify things like layer height and infill percentage and stuff like this can give you different quality prints and also different speed of prints. So here we're actually printing most things at a, a lower or like a higher res excuse me, a lower resolution than the printers actually support, mainly because we want to get parts out to you quicker. So you'll get your part and you might notice that you can very easily see the layers that make up your part. And it's mostly because there's a lot of things to print and we want to get them out fast. But 
when you're printing your own things in your apartment or at a hacker space, you can fine tune those numbers a lot better so you can get really, really nice prints. What's the longest print you've ever done? I have definitely left things overnight. So <laughs> there's a really awesome uh, artist in Israel, I think, who made these really awesome mathematical um, models that look, they come out like big meshes, but he made a really awesome Klein bottle, and then he made a really awesome conch shell. So like full size of our Replicator 2 build platform, <laughs> built like printing a conch shell, so that like started in the morning one day, and I left it overnight and came back the next day, and it was still going, so. That's awesome. Very long. You didn't burn your office down. That's very impressive, nope. too. <laughs> I think the longest I've done is like six hours, and that's okay. it. But I think my machine would then just start falling apart at that <laughs> stage. So. so how does it cut it like into layers? So that's independent of every slicer. Every slicer has a different implementation of how they actually do it. But the way I look at it, or the way I picture it a lot, is that it's kind of like a really fast robotic ninja. And it throws up like a pineapple or a watermelon and then slices it really quickly with its katana <laughs> and it lands in different layers. But that's exactly how it works. <laughs> and, There's uh, a little computer doing that somewhere. <laughs> so that's your uh, introduction to voxels. If you'd like more information, definitely Google what voxels are. And you can come and bother us if you have any questions as well. Yes, 20 <laughs> minutes is very short for us to cover everything, but it is a fascinating technical field. So G-code is the language that machines understand. And it's not just 3D printers, right? Nope. Like, what other machines understand G-code? Uh, like, any CNC mill or mm -hmm. lathe is probably also going to be using G-code. Exactly. So. so they kind of all kind of speak a very similar language. And G-code has been around for, like, a very long time. So you're like, what, what does G-code, like, even look like? Well, here's a, a few samples. And I probably should have split these out. But the first one you see there, it says G0X12. And what that means is we've, you've got a 3D printer, right? It goes up and down, it goes left and right, and then it goes forward and back. And so the left and right um, you know, linear actuation is actually the x-axis. And so if I said rapid move to 12, then it would move to positive x12. So you can actually see it as like you know, when you did graphs in high school and stuff like that. And so if you just say that, it'll just move straight there, and it won't ask any questions. Um, if you type in M106, which is the fan command, and then give it a, um, a speed to turn on, and that's a value from 0 to 255, of course, because we're talking computers, the S127, for example, is approximately 50% speed. Um, then if you want to turn the fan off, the third line there is M106, and then you just set it to S0. Pretty simple. So we actually like program a lot of these commands as our start G code. So when you sort of see the 3D printer start up and it's about to start a print, it's doing lots of things. It's preheating, it's figuring out whether to turn the fan on, it's, it's going into the home positions, and it's basically like getting ready to do a print. So you can hand, hand code these, and if you're really crazy, you could hand code an entire 3D printing file if you really wanted to, but that's what we have slices for. And so, again, G28Y means move the y-axis to the home position. So that's a really nice, easy command. Um, and M27, another um, random one we picked, reports the status of an SD card print. So if you're printing off SD card, you can run that command even while it's printing, and the printer will um, shoot back to you like what the status is. Is it like X percentage done, or is it almost done? Just stuff like that, which is really, really cool. So G-code is just like really simple little blocks, and it's actually blocking instruction code. So it's not asynchronous, and so it's really easily predictable and that kind of thing. Yeah. It's really easy to debug, we found out too yes. yesterday. It's <laughs> pretty easy to debug. It's really nice. <laughs> I mean, like the commands are kind of obtuse. You don't really know what G0 is if you just look at it. I mean, I guess it kind of looks like Go, which I just realized. But um, <laughs> So it's kind of tricky to look at, but if you have like a reference guide, it's pretty easy to figure out where things are going right or wrong. Yeah, the RefRap website has an amazing um, like reference where it's all kind of like hot linked down to the section on the page, and it describes like the software that they created to to run the the machines, and they run almost every G code command. Cool. So the missing link to this was actually the beginning part, right? So how do I make models to print in the first place? Well, a lot of you um, were awesome and went ahead and went straight to thingiverse.com to search for robotics models, and like, Thingiverse has a lot of them. So it's, um, that's w one definite way that you can print at robots.conf. Um, this year, you can actually go online, maybe search for a keyword if you're looking for robot wheels, or if you want an arm or, or something. 
claw, We're, landing yeah. gear, mm -hmm. whatever. Whatever, we can, you can send us the link and we can definitely see if we can print that for you. The cool thing about Thingiverse is you don't need any modeling skills. You know, you're leveraging other people's stuff that they uploaded for free. And again, there's lots of robot parts available on there, so definitely take your time having a shop around and decide which part is best for your bot. You can also use a 3D modeling package if you have something in mind that no one's created or if you just want to add your own flavor to something and, and try recreating it for yourself. Um, there are a huge variety of 3D modeling packages out there, but I'm just going to cover two very quickly. And um, the first one is Tinkercad, right? And you yeah. wrote a tutorial for an introduction for Tinkercad. It's it? somewhere on the internet. I don't they actually know. They will find it for you. <laughs> Tinkercad is also very easy to use. They have a very nice, uh, like if you, when you first sign in, they walk you through everything, and it's very, very nice to use. And it also has an uh, import, so you can take mm -hmm. a part from Thingiverse and like add a face on it or add an extra <laughs> wheel or whatever. Put your name on it or something like that. Yeah, so Tinkercad is really cool. It works in your browser, so Chrome or Firefox. Um, so obviously it works on every single operating system. It's ideal for beginners because you're kind of just taking geometric shapes and like putting them together and overlapping them to create your overall shape you want. And you can group them and you can actually use other shapes to tunnel holes through through other shapes. It's very, very cool. So definitely check that out. It was actually created specifically with 3D print um, printing in mind, so people that are like relatively new to 3D modeling or just kind of think about um, this, the 3D model they're trying to print in a different way. And it also hooks into 3D printing APIs, so you can download the STL immediately or you can actually upload it to online 3D printing services, which is really cool. The other software package that I'll touch on briefly is OpenSCAD. And have you used OpenSCAD before? Oh, very little. <laughs> I'm kind of the same. I find the language a little bit of a learning curve, but yeah. it is very powerful, right? I like OpenSCAD a lot for automating something, like if I'm generating a 3D part yes. programmatically. So I yes. made a lot of name tags for people in our office, and it was nice to just be able to feed a string and spit out a 3D model. It's a very programmatic 3D modeler, so it's not, you can't really look at it and be like, oh, I know exactly what this looks like. Right. And so, like, essentially, you write a, a, a bunch of kind of um, lines of code, and then you hit a button, and it will then go and create a render for you. And so, has anyone in here used 3GS at all? Yeah, so that's like a programmatic thing where you're like writing a bunch of lines, and then you refresh the browser, and you're like, oh, I guess that's kind of what I want. OpenSCAD is very much like that, but it does have its own language. But it is very easy to learn, and it's a very kind of limited language. It's just the way that you put the lines together and the way that you nest the commands is kind of how it goes together. So it's not a traditional 3D modeling program, but it is designed for programmer types, so I figured it was definitely worth mentioning for RobotsConf. And the cool thing that um, Mike touched on is that it's parametric. So if you have like a model that has very spe specific dimensions for things, you can actually store them in variables at the top of the file. And any time you want to make any small changes, so for example, oh, I want this wheel to be better, or I want it to fit over a larger servo um, you know, ending or something like that, you can just twiddle with the numbers or twiddle with the string that comes on the name badge and then rerun the file and it works. And so it's very, very cool for that because otherwise having to modify that manually can kind of be a pain in other programs. So we will print your stuff. Uh, Mike and I put together a, a quick print queue and um, so far we kind of have some room for more this afternoon. I think we have, well, at least when we walked away, there were like three or four queued, so. so we've got There's a slowly a line forming for prints. <laughs> so if you find anything, or if you want, like, kind of um, show us a model that you've made in uh, Tinkercad or anything like that, we're absolutely happy to have a look and help you out. We're not just kind of sitting there and, and judging you for all your prints. We promise we're trying to get all the prints out to everybody, and we're actually here to help you. So please don't be shy. Come and talk to us anytime you want. And again, that, that URL to uh, print something is print.robotsconf.com. Thank you, Chris, for setting that up at short notice. And uh, yeah, this, this is us on Twitter, and come and see us in real life, too. Thank you. We want to print your things. <laughs> I have a question. Where do you see 3D printing going in the next 10 years? I think, um, I think that... This is going to sound weird, but back in the day, um, when microwaves were invented, everyone said, well, we have a stove top and we have an oven, and so, like, why would I want a microwave? Um, you know, it's, it's convenient, yes, but I just can't think about it, and there's no spot in the kitchen for it, and things like that. What I believe we'll see is things like people building house plans to make room for 
3D printers. And you know, 3D printers getting super sophisticated where you can actually print in such a large variety of materials and so cheaply, and, and they're able to print really sophisticated, complex shapes that you actually will be kind of doing things on demand and you'll be equipped with the skills to create everything that you need to. So instead of going to Best Buy and buying, or like, um, what's it called, Bed Bath & Beyond, and buying a product that's kind of the closest to what you want, but it's just never exactly what you want, you'll actually hopefully be equipped to be able to design whatever you want in your house, and then that's it. Like, you're 100% empowered to do that sort of stuff. One of my favorite, uh, like, thoughts of the future was uh, there was someone that demoed a thing that you would give it a small vinyl plastic plate, and it would shape it, and you're like, oh, well, I need six plates for this party I'm going to have, and it would shape them into plates. Or you're like, oh, I need 12 bowls for all my guests, and it would shape them into bowls. And then you would put them back in the machine, and it would flatten them back out. And I kind of see something like that happening, where it's like, oh, I need one more of this object, or I need another one. And instead of going to a store, someone will sell you a design online, and you can print it out at home. Imagine not having to sell stuff on Craigslist anymore when you're done with it. You're just like, I will just literally turn that into something else. Yep. What are uh, some of the alternative, alternative routes from, uh, let's say, a 3D printed housing on some prototype to uh, injection molding? Uh, you know, sort of what's compatible in terms of uh, CNC uh, technology um, relative to Tinkercad, OpenSCAD, Inventor, that kind of stuff? I've never injection molded anything, so I have no idea. That was a very broad question. Um, I've done, like, I, I know about casting, which is actually like a viable, it's not like mass manufacturing, but you can actually use 3D printed parts to do lost casting, right? So you can create the cast with, you know, the 3D printed part inside and then burn it out. And you can, this, I've seen people on Hackaday burn things out in a microwave even, which is, yeah, a little bit dangerous. Mm -hmm. But as far as injection molding goes, like, have you guys heard of the glyph? So the glyph is like that little tripod attachment that allows you to put your iPhone on a tripod. And so they had, I think they were one of, the, one of those first kind of crowdfunded campaigns. I think so, yeah. And um, they essentially had all of these 3D printed prototypes and they actually blogged about how they did it. They used like Rhino 3D, which is a, a program that works on, um, I think, all platforms. And they actually offered like, for people that backed a certain amount, you got like an actual 3D printed version and then you could also back a different amount and get the final injection molded version. And so people are still kind of use it, using it for prototyping mostly. Um, but at the same time, like I can see um, 3D printers getting so sophisticated that you're removing that and that instead of having to mass manufacture the same thing, you're just making slight differences and you're actually um, manufacturing that way instead. It's a little more of a bespoke kind of um, industry. And like complexity in 3D printing doesn't cost anything and complexity in other manufacturing techniques do actually cost money. So I'm hoping to see a shift in that regard.